Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour. Bienvenue dans cette quatrième session plénière intitulée « Ligne de front, les syndromes d'une nouvelle guerre froide ». La guerre commerciale et technologique de plus en plus ouverte entre Pékin et Washington. Les risques appréhendés d'une confrontation militaire autour de Taïwan entre les États-Unis et la Chine. La guerre en Ukraine et le jeu des alliances qu'elle réimpose comme incontournable à la sécurité du continent européen. Les syndromes d'une nouvelle guerre froide apparaissent de plus en plus nombreux, aigus, sévères. Mais peut-on vraiment raisonner en termes de bloc comme nous le faisions pendant la guerre froide de 1947 à 1991 Quelle place et quelle importance laisserait-elle cette logique de bloc aux pays non alignés Quelles peuvent être les conséquences d'une nouvelle guerre froide sur la mondialisation et la prospérité internationale telles que nous les connaissons depuis 30 ans Voici, très résumé, quelques-unes des questions sur lesquelles se pencheront en ce début d'après-midi nos distingués invités. Je vous les présente. Son Excellence Hubert Védrine, ancien ministre des Affaires étrangères de la France. L'honorable Liam Fox, député britannique et ancien secrétaire d'État au commerce international. Monsieur Javier Colomina, député assistant secretary general for political affairs and security policy à l'OTAN. Professeur Mark Ellenborgen, expert conseiller en politique étrangère, nous venons des États-Unis. Docteur Ahmad Ebrahim Abdullah, directeur exécutif du Bahrain Center for Strategic, International and Energy Studies. Et son Excellence Peter Siarto, ministre des Affaires étrangères et du commerce de Hongrie, notre keynote speaker pour ce panel, auquel je laisse tout de suite la parole pour lancer notre discussion. Monsieur Siarto, bienvenue et merci. Good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen, your excellencies. First of all, allow me to express my appreciation to the organizers of ME Days to uh, include me as a uh, keynote speaker uh, to the uh, program. And especially, I appreciate the opportunity to address you on this uh, very exciting uh, topic. Well, back in Hungary, we do consider this year, 2022, as a year of big disappointments. Why? Because two very legitimate expectations of ours became basically naive illusions this year. We have just kind of recovered after the pandemic, which was definitely not easy. We have to get used to a totally new way of lifestyle, not meeting each other, putting most of our lives on the virtual space. And we had to get used to a new world order and a new system, a new way of operation of global economy as well. As we enter this year, 2022, I think we had the legitimate hope that this whole thing is over. We had the legitimate hope that our very strong and severe efforts were successful and we can come back to our usual way of life. But unfortunately, another legitimate expectation of ours became naive illusion. Which one was that? My generation, the generation I belong to, those ones who uh, were born at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, and living in uh, Central Europe, we only had to live a couple years under the communist dictatorship. And we only heard the uh, terrible uh, experiences about the wars from our grandparents. And we had the hope that we would never have to experience these terrible things in our neighborhood during our lives. Now, the war in Ukraine broke uh, which broke out at the end of February, made these legitimate expectations of ours 
as naive illusions. The country I'm representing, Hungary, is a neighboring country to Ukraine. And as a neighboring country, we experience all the negative impacts of this war in an immediate and severe way. For example, to put it on the first place, we have received more than one million refugees so far from Ukraine. And for those who stay on the territory of uh, Hungary, we offer jobs and more than 1,300 schools and kindergartens have enrolled refugee kids and students. The prices in Europe and especially in the neighborhood of Ukraine are skyrocketing. Energy, food, commodities, and inflation. Imagine last year, my country had to pay 7 billion euros for importing energy. 7 billion euros. This year, we have to pay 19 billion. And if the forecasts are valid, valid, next year we have to pay 29 uh, billion euros. These are the impacts. And on the other hand, European Union has introduced sanctions. Eight packages altogether. Now, according to our understanding, which is not the mainstream, so you might hear something different during the panel, these sanctions have failed. Why? Because the promises and the expectations attached to these sanctions have nothing to do with the current reality. The expectation and the promise was that the sanctions would lead to a quick, quick conclusion of the war, putting Russia's economy on its knees. Now what has been happening? The war is more brutal than ever, although we are more than eight months after. And in the meantime, European economy is suffering very badly. And in this regard, Hungary's national interest is very clear. We are super interested in peace. And as a neighboring country, it is extremely important for us not to get involved into this war. And this national interest of ours explains, I think, very, very clearly why we made the decision not to deliver weapons to Ukraine and why we made the decision as the only country in the European Union not to take part in EU's uh, military training operation in the framework of which Europeans are training uh, uh, members of Ukrainian military. Of course, for these two decisions of ours, we are under very, very heavy and severe attacks on a daily basis, politically and media-wise as well. Hungary, the country I represent, is located in Central Europe. And in Central Europe, we have unfortunately had the opportunity to learn the lessons of history. And this says that whenever there's a conflict between East and West, we Central Europeans always lose, always. Regardless of what time the conflict takes place, regardless of who are the stakeholders, regardless what is the reason. And I don't think there's any need to be explained to us how brutal such a war can be, given the fact that we had to fight for our freedom under communist dictatorship as well. And in 1956, during our revolution, we have learned it too well, how it feels to be occupied by the East and in the meantime, being let down by the West as giving no help to our struggle for freedom. So why we are really concerned in Hungary? We are really concerned because the voice of escalation is much louder than the voice of peace. The voice of peace is hardly to be heard currently in the international political discourse. Last time, when we had the meeting of the 27 foreign ministers of EU member states, I was the only one who used the word peace in an intervention during uh, our point of agenda on the situation in Ukraine. So one ocean away from this conflict, thousands of kilometers away from this war, this might look different, but everybody should remember that those who are in the neighborhood are under the biggest risk of escalation because of geography. So that's why we do not want anybody to provocate escalation of this war on our expense. Why? Because Hungarian people are not responsible for this war. 
That's why Hungarian people should not be forced to pay the price of this uh, war. And we will not allow anybody to force Hungarian people to pay higher prices of this war than they have paid so far. So, Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, my message from the neighborhood is that this war must be stopped as soon as possible. Because now, this is a regional war. A regional war with worldwide impacts. And basically, we are, believe me, beyond the last hour to prevent this regional war becoming a worldwide war itself. That's why the most important task now is to reopen the communication channels. Because if the communication channels are given up, then the hope for peace is being given up as well. And the title of this very panel has Cold War um, in it. And, you know, I regret to say, but in this regard, the situation during Cold War was better than currently. Why? Because at least the communication channels were open during uh, the Cold War between the sides. And remember, during those multiple decades of Cold War, there were numerous occasions when armed conflict, namely World War III, was very close. And how these dangerous situations uh, were overcome? By communication. Last minute communication between the United States and Soviet Union at that time. So communication must be reestablished this time as well between the Russians and the Americans. Because I regret to say, but those who think that this war can be ended with negotiations between the Ukrainians and Russians are naive. Dialogue between Russia and the United States must take place in order to uh, conclude this war uh, finally. You know, we Hungarians uh, really do try to maintain the dialogue with the Russians, but whenever we do so, we always are faced with uh, enormous, unfair and very heated attacks, considering us as spies of Putin, allies of the Russians, breakers of the European unity. Only because of maintaining the communication channels, and this is too bad. And I would like to draw your attention to another extremely important goal, which we must take into consideration. We do have to make our best to avoid any kind of direct confrontation between NATO and the Russians. Because such a direct confrontation would easily end up in the Third World War. So that's why for us Hungarians, the most important target during all NATO meetings is that NATO must refrain from saying or deciding anything which would lead to escalation and to a direct confrontation. So, dear colleagues, Cold War was terrible for us Central Europeans. We had to live under dictatorship. We lost the chances. We lost the opportunities of uh, forward progress. We lost freedom. We lost uh, liberty. But I have to tell you that the current global political situation puts similar threats on us unless common sense will prevail and voice of those who want peace will become louder. Because if the voice of those who want peace will become louder, then immediate ceasefire must be made and peace talks must be started. And we understand that the upcoming G20 summit might offer a chance for that. So if the two presidents, President of Russia and the United States, are going to participate, that would mean that they would stay at the same physical location. And I have to tell you, it would be very hard for them to explain to all of us, global citizens, why they would not meet. And I understand that the protocol is important. I understand it's important to show who is stronger and who is not. But they have to take into consideration that people are dying, people are forced to leave their homes, economies are suffering, jobs uh, are being lost. So they do have to meet. And they do have to talk to each other. And just... Finally, let me draw your attention to two additional security-related impacts of this war, which might be telling from the perspective of how important dialogue is. You know that this war puts a tremendous risk at uh, a safe supply of food globally. And we all know that it was about the enormous efforts made by Turkey to be able to uh, put the grain deal together. 
we didn't really have the hope at the start of the negotiations that, that, that they would be uh, concluded and completed uh, successfully. But, but regardless of discussions being tough, the outcome was obvious and discussion was successful. Do not forget, during the Cold War, last time communication helped to prevent the World War to break out. And when it comes to the global food crisis, we all know that it can cause instability in regions which are kind of easy to be destabilized. And in case of these regions being faced with a uh, crisis of food supply, extremism and violence uh, can break out. And then another illegal migratory flaws uh, will, um, uh, will break out. And if that will be the case, then Europe will face another security-related challenge. And I'm not quite sure that Europe could face two such kind of security-related challenges in the meantime. We Hungarians are under double pressure currently, as we have the war in the eastern neighborhood, and as we are protecting the external border of the European Union from the south, which is under siege, given the fact that we had to stop 230,000 illegal migrants this year already. So concluding, uh, dear colleagues, we in Central Europe were the losers of the Cold War period. But at least at that time, there was a communication channel between East and West as a last resort. Now, as there is no communication, this is extremely dangerous. And we don't want another generations of ours, Hungarians and Central Europeans, to lose decades of their lives. So our message from the neighborhood of the war is communication must be reestablished, war must be stopped, and do not provocate any escalation on our expense. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you for including me into the program. Thank you, Minister Sijato, for your precious insight and stimulating ideas. Uh, I understand that you have a business schedule today in Tenje, and we are privileged to uh, have you take some time to open our discussion. We hope you will have productive, productive meetings today. Monsieur Vedrin, uh, permettez-moi de me tourner vers vous pour poursuivre uh, notre discussion. Pensez-vous que l'expression « nouvelle guerre froide » oui. uh, soit appropriée pour qualifier l'état de la situation internationale à l'heure actuelle M'entendez Oui. Je pense que je suis d'accord avec le ministre hongrois. La situation est plus grave que pendant la guerre froide. D'abord, ce n'est pas une guerre froide, c'est plusieurs en même temps. D'autre part, elle n'est pas uniquement froide. La guerre en Ukraine, elle est chaude. La guerre froide, c'est une guerre qui n'est pas devenue la guerre. Après, il y a la, il y a la dimension États-Unis-Chine. Donc c'est plus compliqué en réalité. Je reviendrai après sur euh, la chasesse qu'on devrait retirer de la façon dont la guerre froide a été gérée. Pas au début, mais à partir de la crise de Cuba. Et pour euh, répondre plus largement à votre question, je dirais que les événements que nous vivons amènent à une remise en cause énorme, énorme, très compliquée, par l'Occident. Et les autres se font des illusions. Alors, la remise en cause de l'Occident, c'est l'Occident qui a cru dominer le monde. Je ne reviens pas sur les, les siècles de colonisation, pourquoi, comment, etc. Mais je parle de l'époque contemporaine. Les États-Unis ont dominé, ont gagné la guerre en 1945, heureusement d'ailleurs. Et après, après la fin de l'Union soviétique, ils ont cru dominer le monde. C'est ce que j'avais appelé l'hyperpuissance. On peut parler du bris. On peut parler de monde unipolaire. Et les Américains l'ont vécu sur un mode de puissance et les Européens sur un mode naïf. C'est en Europe qu'on a énormément cru dans la communauté internationale. En fait, il n'y en a pas. Il y a un monde dans lequel il y a des affrontements entre des pays, des nations, des forces économiques, culturelles, identitaires, religieuses, etc. Mais les Européens ont beaucoup cru ça. La communauté internationale, les Nations unies. Heureusement que ça existe, mais les nations ne sont pas unies. Elles sont en compétition. 
le multilatéralisme. Et en fait, c'est la poursuite de la compétition sous une autre forme. Donc pour les Européens d'aujourd'hui, c'est quand même encore plus dur que pour les autres de réaliser le monde actuel. Alors que pour les Américains, rester fidèles à l'idée de la puissance, ils en font parfois un bon usage, parfois un mauvais, ça dépend, mais le choc est moins grand. Donc il y a un, disons, il y a un phénomène qui coïncide en plus avec une contestation populiste dans toutes les démocraties, parce que les peuples ne se sont pas à l'aise dans la mondialisation était une américano-globalisation, en réalité, dérégulée, financiarisée, etc. On voit bien le décrochage des peuples. On l'a vu avec Trump, on le voit avec le Brexit, on l'a vu, on le voit en Italie, enfin un peu partout, en réalité. Donc il y a une crise démocratie, et à ce moment-là, il y a un défi. Mais les problèmes ne naissent pas de l'agression de Poutine. Mais quand Poutine agresse, alors, quels que soient les arguments russes, rien ne justifie l'attaque de l'Ukraine. Rien ne justifie un seul mort ukrainien, même si la Russie a parfois des arguments. Mais ce n'est pas Poutine qui crée la crise des démocraties. Au contraire, ça provoque une réaction. Donc je pense qu'il y a plusieurs crises qui s'emboîtent et que les Occidentaux doivent faire preuve de réalisme, d'intelligence stratégique et revenir justement à la façon dont les Américains, pour le coup très bien, là, ont géré la guerre froide. Alors, les illusions des autres, et je serai rapide là-dessus, les illusions des autres. Il y a beaucoup de pays, les pays qui n'ont pas voulu... On peut peut-être y revenir dans la deuxième question, dans la deuxième ronde des questions, parce que j'allais justement vous poser okay. euh, la Alors, question... Alors, je reviendrai sur les illusions du, du Sud global après. D'accord, merci. Monsieur Fox, je vous ai vu bouger euh, la tête. Euh, Avez-vous une perspective, maintenant que le Royaume-Uni a une position peut-être un peu différente, euh, une perspective qui serait différente de celle de, de M. Védrine sur les, les dynamiques de cette nouvelle guerre froide, si on peut l'appeler ainsi. Well, I think a lot of this debate is around terminology. And the construct uh, of the Cold War was always more a political construct, I think, than uh, a military one. And what we really mean by that is a state of affairs where you have two deeply opposing ideological uh, players. And if you look at where we are today, it's not just Russia, but I would also include China and Iran in this. Uh, what do they have in common? They're not democracies. They have an arbitrary rule of law. They don't have respect for human rights. And here we have a huge ideological difference between what kind of world we want to live in and the kind of world that they want to and have actually achieved for themselves. And I think that the first thing I would say is that we must remember that peace is not the natural state of affairs in the world. Uh, chaos is the natural state of affairs. And if we want to have something different, we have to have concepts of international law and international behavior uh, that we can be willing to export and to argue for and sometimes fight for. I've heard some of my European colleagues say, we think we should be neutral because we think we're better uh, as a nation shaped for peacekeeping than war fighting. Well, frankly, uh, sometimes uh, you have to fight for the peace uh, and you cannot abdicate your responsibility for that in a world where you want there to be international law maintained. Then we come to the, the specific the dispute with, with Russia And if you want to have that, that, that peace, you have to have those ideological elements, but you also have to have military deterrence. And we failed, I'm afraid, in the West on military deterrence with Russia. Uh, Putin went to the uh, security conference in Munich in 2007. He told us exactly what his worldview was. He actually laid out what was going to happen. And a number of countries in Europe, and I'm afraid that I would primarily point the finger at Germany on this, wanted the, uh, to take a particular interpretation of what Putin had said. He then uh, attacked Georgia in 2008. He attacked uh, Crimea 2014. Me, Could whoever has that phone on turn it off? It's very annoying. That's all right. Putin gets everywhere. Uh, sorry. Um, and uh, uh, deterrence is, is key. 
we did not respond to Russian aggression in Georgia and Crimea as we should have. And as always, when you have a failure of deterrence, the action you have to take later is greater than that which you might have had to take early on in the process. And there's a clear warning uh, for us to that as we read across to China and Iran uh, in their respective regions about why deterrence is absolutely essential. Merci, Monsieur Fox. J'en viens à vous, hein, Monsieur Colomina. Euh, dans, cette, dans ce contexte actuel, euh, l'OTAN a-t-elle toute sa place, comme elle l'avait pendant la, la guerre froide 1.0 Oui, merci. Et, et tout d'abord, permettez-moi de, de, de vous remercier pour m'avoir ici, de remercier les organisateurs et, et le Royaume du Maroc pour organiser cette conférence aussi. Euh, donc, euh, c'est une question euh, difficile à répondre, mais euh, moi, je dirais que ce qu'il y a sûrement, c'est une, compé une compétition géostratégique, ça c'est sûr, et une compétition de, de, de grands pouvoirs. Et à ce sujet, euh, justement, je vais tout d'abord euh, vous expliquer très brièvement quelle est la position de l'OTAN envers euh, la Russie et envers la Chine, parce que de cette explication, vous aurez déjà une perception plutôt claire de, de quelle est notre réflexion sur votre question. And I will do that in English uh, because I want to uh, use the specific terms that we use to define our position uh, uh, with regard to Russia and with regard to China, which is, as I said, very different. On uh, Russia, Russia is for NATO uh, uh, an adversary, is a threat, is an aggressor. Uh, we have a very clear view on that and uh, that's why we decided to increase uh, fundamentally our, our deterrent uh, capacity and as uh, Mr. Fox was saying we thought it was it was something that we needed to do we doubled uh, the forces we have in the Eastern Front and uh, fundamentally we changed the ability of our military commanders to uh, generate the force that we need at one particular time just to give you an example a figure in the 14 days that came after February 24th after the beginning of Russia's aggression against Ukraine, NATO was able to move 40,000 troops, 300 aircraft, and more than 100 ship, uh, ships. That was only in 14 days. Today, with the new force model, that's how we call it, our military commanders will be able to do probably in the same two or three weeks, move 300,000 troops. So we have decided clearly to step up the game, to, to, to have a, a, a stronger deterrence and also a stronger capacity to defend ourselves because we have defined our position towards Russia in a very clear way. It is an aggressor, it is a threat. That is what we should do right now to support Ukraine, and that's what we're doing, and to isolate Russia, to support Ukraine as much as we can in order to give them the better chances in the battlefield and in whatever they decide to do in the future, uh, uh, if they want to go into uh, talks or whatever they decide. It is their decision and we need to give them the best possible chance to do uh, what they uh, uh, might decide. On China, it's completely different. China is not a threat for NATO. It's a challenge, a security challenge, uh, that we see very clearly on the cyber and on the hybrid domain, but is a challenge, is not an adversary, is, uh, it represents a systemic challenge to the international rules-based order, to the global governance as we believe uh, we, the system we provided ourselves after the Second World War, but it is also an actor with whom we should engage, and we are trying to engage China on different matters. In, in, in the domains where NATO is responsible, basically arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation and climate change and security. But others, such as the European Union or the UN, are uh, today engaging with China in global affairs, in global governance, in other things. So that already puts things on, on the right perspective. Um, I, I believe that that takes us, uh, as, as I heard, to a sort of a, a, a great power competition with countries that are non-democratic, and that puts the world in a stress uh, that was uh, not known in the last 20, 30 years, but we should try to move ourselves from that impression that we're moving towards a, a Cold War. Um, in particular, and uh, let me probably end with uh, that, 
but since I heard very um, uh, um, uh, quietly the uh, explanation by the Hungarian minister, NATO has been doing in the last eight months what I believe, and I said it uh, very often, the most important task that NATO has fulfilled in the last 70 years, and that is to be extremely responsible towards a situation that, as horrible as it is, is a local war. We should prevent that from becoming global, and that's why we have decided to step up our deterrence, to step up our defense, and to isolate Russia. I think right now that's what we should do. Merci, merci, Monsieur Colomina. Je me tourne vers vous, uh, Professor Ellen Bogan. Il y a quelques uh, instants, Monsieur Vedrin soulignait que les États-Unis avaient été particulièrement habiles pour gérer la Première Guerre froide. Pensez-vous que Washington sera tout aussi habile pour gérer cette éventuelle nouvelle guerre froide Well, I don't see it as a first or a second Cold War. I see it a continuation. And when I used to raise those issues in the White House in previous times, uh, nobody really wanted to listen to me. Uh, at the beginning of last year, people like me were already warning about Mr. Putin and his entry into Ukraine. And there are things that were being done at that time, which I can't talk about, which in fact were the prelude to being in there later. And I don't mean that because Mr. Putin says we caused the war and he responded, that's why we were there. Let's get one thing clear. I don't know what Kool-Aid Mr. Seattle is drinking in Hungary, but I do know the Kool-Aid that Mr. Putin serves to his friends and enemies, and that is Novichok, murder, non-democracy, shutting down the press, killing Starovoiteva, killing Politskovkaya, trying to murder Mr. Navalny, trying to murder Mr. Skipol, killing 10 oligarchs since this war has started, sending 100,000 innocent boys and men into a war that are already dead with 20,000 wounded and 15,000 deserting. That is the man that Hungary is trying to defend. Under Mr. Orban, the only thing Hungary cares about is more money and more corruption and more EU funds, and certainly not what's happening on this planet. So with all due respect, this is already a global war. You can see it. Prices are going up. Sorry, first day with my new elbow. Um, and it is a different kind of war than World War II. It is a different kind of war than other wars than World War I, but it is a global war. It's become a war of cookies, of Trojans, of spying, of listening, of using drones, of monitoring, of using economics to do your dirty deeds, shut off gas, shut off oil, uh, blow up what he's now doing energy supply lines because he's trying to freeze the Ukraine to death. And I have spent the last year running around Ukraine, and I don't mean Kiev and Lvov and Uzhgorod, for those who don't know, uh, Uzhgorod is here, Lvov used to be part of Poland, Kiev is here, so it's east in the Donbas area. And we've been helping to bring out supplies and helping to try to figure out what to do and even losing people, which will never be in the press. So what do I think of Cold War I and II? doesn't exist. It's different chapters of the same thing, but we were bamboozled at the time. We thought Yeltsin was a knife guy. I was a soldier then. I remember negotiating. I was the aide de camp to West Clark. I remember what it was like to have to go when my Russian was still okay. Aber mein Deutsch ist noch gut, so I could talk to many of the Russians and certainly. And so the net result is we played our cards then with trust. Were all the negotiations about NATO and about the Warsaw Pact and about Minsk agreement things that all went the right way? No, but I can assure you we never promised Russia anything like they claim publicly. They proposed it, but it was not agreed upon. So that's my first comments. And with all due respect, if you want to believe what the Hungarians are saying, then I'll sell you gold in the Sahara. Thank you. Merci, M. Ellen Mogan. Je me tourne vers vous, Dr. Abdullah. Si on est sur euh, le point de commencer une nouvelle guerre froide, ou si on poursuit euh, une qui ne se serait pas euh, terminée, euh, quelle est dans ce contexte la posture, la position pour le Moyen-Orient
شكرا لكم سعادة الرئيس بداية أتوجه لكم بخالص الشكر والتقدير على هذه الدعوة الكريمة للمشاركة في النسخة الرابعة عشر لمؤتمر أميديوس وقد دونت بعض الملاحظات مسبقا الخاصة بالإجابة عن هذا الاستفسار فقبيل الحديث عن موضوع الحرب الباردة دعوني أشير إلى أن أنه لم تكن المنطقة منطقة الشرق الأوسط بعيدة عن التطورات العالمية سواء كانت من خلال الحروب الكبرى التي طالتها فصولها أيضا أراضي المنطقة مثل معركة العالمين الأولى اللي وقعت في يونيو عام 1942 والثانية أيضا في نوفمبر من عام 1942 على الأراضي المصرية أو الحرب الباردة بما تضمنته أيضا من اصطفافات إلى جانب هذا المعسكر أو ذاك وصولا إلى الأزمات التي شهدتها المنطقة وما تلاها أيضا من أحداث ومع أهمية ما سبق ذكره عن أزمات بعينها كان يكتسب أهمية فإن الحديث عن حرب باردة ثانية يكتسب أيضا أهمية أكبر لأنه لم يكن أو يكون حديث عن موقف مواقف تجاه أزمة عابرة وإنهما شراكات تؤسس على تؤسس على مصالح بدلا من الأسس الأيديولوجية التي اتسمت فيها مرحلة الحرب الباردة والسؤال الذي يطرح نفسه بقوة هل نحن بصدد بدء حرب باردة جديدة على خلفية الأزمة الأوكرانية الراهنة واقع الأمر أن الصراع الروسي الغربي لم ينتهي مع انتهاء الحرب الباردة وانحيار الاتحاد السوفيتي في عام 1991 للميلاد فقد انتقل إلى مستوى آخر مع اندلاع الأزمة الأوكرانية الراهنة ولكن ربما يكون القول بأننا سوف نشهد نظاما دوليا متعدد الأقطاب مجددا يبدو حكما سابقا لأوانه على الأقل على المدى المنظور القريب وهي للأسباب الآتية السبب الأول أنه من خلال العقدين الأخيرين شهدت منطقة الخليج العربي وأيضا المنطقة العربية والشرق الأوسط أزمات ساهمت الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية بحسمها بغض النظر عن نتائجها على المنظومة الأمن الإقليمي والخليجي ومن ذلك مثلا حرب تحرير الكويت في عام 1991 وأيضا الغزو الأمريكي للعراق في عام 2003 والتدخل الأطلسي في ليبيا في عام 2011 والسبب الثاني أنه مفهوم القوة لم يعد أيضا يرتبط فقط بالأسلحة التقليدية والنووية بل برز أيضا مفهوم شامل للقوة فالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية بالإضافة إلى امتلاكها قوة نووية وقوات تقليدية ومن بينها قوات بحرية تمثلها أساطيل تتمركز في مناطق استراتيجية من العالم فإن الجامعات الأمريكية لا تزال تصنف في المراتب الأولى عالميا بالإضافة للمنتجات الأمريكية وجميعها تعكس مفهوم القوى الناعمة للولايات المتحدة الأمريكية السبب الثالث أن النظام الدولي المتعارف عليه منذ انتهاء الحرب الباردة وحتى الآن يميل لصالح الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية ويبرز ذلك سواء من خلال سلوك التصويت في مجلس الأمن أو محاولة أيضا التواجد في تلك المناطق التي تراها تلك القوى مناطق حيوية بالنسبة لمصالحها وشكرا Merci, docteur Abdullah. Si vous, si vous me permettez, je vais rester avec vous pour commencer la, la deuxième uh, ronde de questions, uh, docteur Abdullah. Uh, what's your perspective on global security uh, in regard to the situation in Ukraine? And do you believe that this situation has brought up new opportunities to maybe reestablish some kind of multilateral action to deal with global security today? سيدي الرئيس شكرا جزيلا على هذا السؤال المهم هناك فرص أتاحتها الأزمة الأوكرانية للأمن الإقليمي من خلال تسارع وتيرة الأحداث ووتيرة التعاون الثنائي ما بين دول المنطقة في العديد من المجالات وخاصة الاقتصادية منها من ناحية ثانية التعبير أيضا عن الهموم والمخاوف الأمنية والأولويات خلال اللقاءات التي جمعت مسؤولي الدول الكبرى مع نظرائهم من دول المنطقة بمعنى آخر فإن الأزمة الأوكرانية وأيضا مع مرافقة بها ما قبلها اللي هو تحدي جائحة كورونا عززت من دور الأمن الإقليمي ومؤسساته مجددا الذي يعد دورا أساسيا من وجهة نظري لثلاثة أسباب هي كالآتي السبب الأول أن هناك قضايا نزاعات إقليمية وخاصة ذات الصلة بالحدود والموارد الطبيعية 
من السهولة بإمكان إيجاد حلول لها عبر المنظمات الإقليمية مثل الاتحاد الأفريقي وجامعة الدول العربية مقارنة بالمنظمات الأممية التي تتضمن توازنات مختلفة للقوى ثانياً أن تنظيمات الأمن الإقليمي كانت ولا تزال تعد أساساً مهماً لتحقيق مفهوم توازن القوى الذي يعد الأساس للأمن الإقليمي ذاته وقد اطلعت ايضا تلك التنظيمات بدور مهم في تحقيق الامن والسلم الاقليميين تكاملا مع ادوار المنظمه الامميه. الثالث دور تنظيمات الامن الاقليمي المطلوب لحسم بعض الازمات حيث نجد ان بعضا من تلك الازمات اضحى مرتهنا بثلاثه دوائر متداخله وهي الدائره المحليه والدائره الاقليميه والدائره الدوليه. ولا تتطابق بالضروره اجندات الاطراف الثلاث. ويبقى التساؤل المهم هل يمكن اعتبار التحولات الدولية الراهنة وقتية أم أنها سوف تؤدي إلى نتائج جوهرية تؤثر على هيكل النظام العالمي المتعارف عليه منذ انتهاء الحرب العالمية الثانية وأيضا نتائج الحرب الباردة فإذا تسمح لي أن أجاوبها بشكل مختصر اختصار على مر التاريخ أثبتت الأزمات الأمنية الكبرى أنها تحتمل السيناريوهات كافة وبغض النظر عن المدى الزمني للأزمة الأوكرانية الراهنة وما سوف يترتب عليه من نتائج على المستوى الأوروبي أو المستوى العالمي فإنها قد قرعت أجراس الإنذار بشأن ثلاثة أمور على وجه العجالة الأمر الأول مفهوم الأمن الوطني فلم يعد ذو مضامين عسكرية فأمن الطاقة والأمن الغذائي أصبحا أيضا أولويتان للعديد من دول العالم الأمر الثاني تنويع وتعدد الشراكات مسألة استراتيجية في ظل تحولات القوى والنفوذ واحتدام التنافس والصراع الدولي في مفاصل مختلفة من الأمن الإقليمي الأمر الثالث مع أهمية وآخر واحد مع أهمية ومحورية دول دور القوى الكبرى تجاه الأمن الإقليمي عموما وحسم بعض الأزمات على نحو خاص فإن ذلك لا يعني انتهاء دور تنظيمات الأمن الإقليمي بل تزداد أهميتها مما يعني ضرورة تطوير عمل تلك التنظيمات بالتوازي مع تطوير العلاقات الإقليمية الثنائية وشكرا مرسي دكتور عبدولا Mais je, je, je rebondis sur la, la fin de votre propos et notamment les, les organisations internationales de sécurité pour me tourner vers euh, Monsieur Colomina. Vous avez euh, exposé de façon très éloquente et, et précise euh, le rôle euh, de l'OTAN dans le cadre de, de la guerre en Ukraine, euh, les perspectives de l'OTAN quant aux défis que représente la Chine euh, et non pas une menace. Mais euh, on a parfois euh, l'impression que dans le discours public, ou du moins une partie des opinions publiques, euh, peut-être pas partout, mais euh, de façon non négligeable, euh, l'OTAN euh, n'est pas perçu avec euh, les mêmes nuances que vous avez euh, apportées. Et donc, de, de votre point de vue, euh, pourquoi déjà cette perception un peu troublée des, des intentions de l'OTAN et l'organisation a-t-elle les, les moyens ou a-t-elle des, des options pour corriger ces perceptions-là, selon vous Merci. Euh, bon, c'est une bonne question et, et c'est une des raisons euh, pour laquelle je me trouve ici, justement pour, pour expliquer qu'est-ce que l'OTAN fait, qu'est-ce que l'OTAN ne fait pas. Euh, moi, je crois que euh, l'OTAN euh, a une position nuancée sur beaucoup de sujets. Euh, c'est vrai que c'est un, une organisation qui est une cible facile euh, pour euh, les populismes. Aujourd'hui, je pense euh, qu'il faut avoir euh, une clarté sur les sujets que l'on retrouve euh, tous les jours. Um, um, and I'm, I'm switching to English uh, again. Um, because it's for us, the consequences of this war are also very important. And uh, when we talk about energy security or when we talk about food security, those are things that are priorities for NATO as well. But we are very clear on that. And, and that is a message that I've been conveying to all our partners, and it's, it's, it's good to remind the audience here that NATO has 37 partners from New Zealand to Colombia to many southern nations. Uh, I was last week in Kuwait. Uh, this week I was in Rabat talking with uh, uh, your own authorities. Um, and it's important to have this in mind. The best way to put a stop to the energy security crisis and the food security crisis is not to call for whatever deal. It's just to make Putin stop the war and withdraw the troops. 
The moment you do that, you put in the blame on the one that has the blame, which is Russia. That's what I said before, we need to isolate Russia. But I, I like to pick up something you asked before, is, is this a moment of opportunity for multilateralism? And uh, I like to just to say a word on that. Uh, when this war started, uh, uh, President Putin thought that it was going to be a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks war. He thought he was going to ununite the West and maybe create cracks in the West or in the world of democracies or whatever you want to call it. And he thought he was going to probably have less NATO or a less relevant NATO. After eight months, what you see is a war that is still going on with Ukrainians fighting bravely uh, and pushing back Russians on the battlefield. You have a NATO that is more, probably more relevant than ever with two uh, new nations that will exceed uh, NATO very soon, Finland and Sweden, and with no cracks, not only in the West, but in democracies in, in general. So a message that I'd like to convey again in this conference is that whenever we have um, a, a, a relationship with our partners and partners that do have legitimately a relationship with Russia, that is just a foreign policy choice that we should respect, NATO respects foreign policy choices by partners and by allies, we just ask those partners to use those channels to put pressure on Russia, to put pressure on Russia to put a stop because that war is not just creating the worst uh, security crisis in the Atlantic area, but food security, energy security, and many other crises that are affecting the global war, world and many of the partners that Russia believe they're their friends. So those friends and those partners should go to Russia and say with their level of influence, these, what you're doing is not harming NATO or is not harming the US or is not harming the West world, whatever you call the West world, is harming all of us and you should put a stop on it. Merci. Monsieur Ellen Bogan, uh, je me retourne uh, vers vous. Uh, I would like to deal with, yeah, uh, to go with you uh, on the field of domestic politics in the US. During the Cold War, one might argue that the solidity of the political system in the US helped Washington defeat the USSR. But today, less than a week away, four days away from the midterms election, the very solidity viability of the U.S. political system and the U.S. democracy seems again to be at stake. Could it be a major weakness for Washington in the years ahead to exert uh, its leadership on the global scene? Well, it's already proving to be. Um, you know, Mr. Trump ran around with a lot of, excuse my French, cojones, and was able to intimidate people and maybe Joe Biden would be able to have more of that, but of course, Donald Trump had a lot of other things which were just abysmal. And Joe Biden is a man from another time. He's a decent, good guy who's nice, who doesn't believe in intrigue. Uh, and so he's used to a time when, as you mentioned in Washington, whether you were a Democrat or a Republican or a conservative Democrat like I am, they used to joke I'm the vice chairman of the Republican wing of the Democratic Party, um, you still sat down and you came up with decisions because you were in fact looking out for the country. Liam Fox, while we were next door, said, uh, he, uh, he, he mentioned the person, I won't mention it here, he can if he'd like, that in fact it seems that politics in the United States today is not about keeping the United States together, I think that's what you said, Liam, but rather whether one gets their own point through. Is, is that what you said? You said something to me, but the point was that we're completely disjoint. So yes, these elections in November 8th are extremely important. And they're also important for the global order and for the new world order and how we treat China. I was born in Germany. I left with four. If Germany spent only four times neutering women as China does millions every year, we would all be accused of being Nazis again. Mein Vater war Deutscher. And so my point is that it is unfortunate that the Middle East, as you've said, 
uh, Dr. Abdullah gets caught in the middle of these things. And of course, I'm sorry, and I do apologize. I'm not apologizing for the government. I can't be speaking for them. But, you know, name me a single success that one of these wars has brought. Not Iraq, not Syria, maybe in Afghanistan, except it costs trillions of dollars, 30% literacy rate around women, 50% of parliamentarians, 50% of managers. Nobody even bothers to talk about the successes in Afghanistan or that NATO spends 90% of its time working behind the scenes, things you do not see, trying to build. In the discussion on immigration and refugees today, migrants and refugees, this issue came up. Of course we need to find ways to provide drinking water for people and schools and the antecedent sufficient things that would make this not happen. But the fact is, the elections are important because if the Republicans in this case, who you have to actually be politically more like me on foreign policy and economics have now flipped, uh, win both houses of Congress, that will massively affect how we deal with Ukraine. It'll massively affect the potential of Donald Trump coming back. I predicted when I was here, however many years ago, when everybody thought I was another, I said, Donald Trump's probably gonna win the elections. People thought, yeah, it's like Europeans thought about Putin going to war in Russia. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I am a polemic guy because I used to have to write speeches for people, but these issues are serious. And this is a global conflict. And Morocco plays a big role in that conflict because you are one of those middle states, a middle state between Africa and Europe. Sometimes you don't know yourselves, if I may say this, who you are. Because you might be a Berber, you might be of French origin, you might be mishmash. You are mishmash, I'm mishmash. But you play a very important role and you should continue to use that role. And so I get very concerned when you are doing exactly what other African countries, although you're Northern African countries do, in that you're getting into massive debt with the Chinese. The Chinese are bad, bad news, not Chinese people. And they will be an even bigger threat than Russia, and they already are. Excuse me, that's my answer to your question, but I'm sorry I strayed from the democratic issue. My apologies. Okay. Okay. Maybe, Mr. Fox, uh, I, I can uh, ask you a follow-up question. Uh, I'd like to have your perspective as a former Secretary of State for International Trade in Great Britain. Do you believe that the current tensions on the international scene uh, make globalization as we know it doomed, and with it, uh, our global prosperity? Yes. I'll just clarify yeah, what I was saying earlier, which I was when I was talking to my friend John McCain, uh, and this was 12 years ago, um, I said that at the time I believed that in American politics, on both sides of the aisle, there were people who would rather see America fail than see their opponents succeed, which I regarded as deeply un-American. Uh, in itself, and I'm afraid that that trend towards deep tribalism has not only continued to affect American politics, but is in danger actually uh, infecting other democratic systems. This, this is why one should fact check, and I'm glad I'm doing it with you present. Thank you. We're having all these discussions about uh, systems, first of all. Let's be very, very clear what we're talking about with Russia. This is a war of choice. A choice by one man, Vladimir Putin, to rain down death and destruction on a democratic European nation. And we have to recognize that we either do something to protect the Ukrainian people or we do nothing. And it is right that we supply them with the weapons that they require to defend themselves. Men, women and children who are having their water cut off, having their electricity cut off, which are almost certainly um, uh, war crimes created purposely by Putin's Kremlin and if a bully is allowed to bully they will bully more and they will bully more widely and it's all very well to talk about the politics but when you have a military aggressor you have to use military force to stand up to that aggression or we will all become victims sooner rather than later that is the brutal choice that we face and we mustn't get away from that very binary thing your question on on your on trade if I can answer, my office always tell me not to give too many statistics, but let me please just give you one. Uh, at the end of the uh, financial crisis, 
only 0.7%, less than 1% of all the imports into the G20 were covered by either a tariff or a non-tariff measure. By the first quarter of 2020, that 0.7% had risen to 10.3% of all the imports of the G20. And let me tell you what that means in practice. It means that we are making it more and more difficult for developing countries to trade their way out of poverty in a sustainable way. Protectionism isn't just an economic evil. It is something that actually has a, a, a security cost further down the line. And, and I think that the thing that needs to be clearly understood is this, that there's a continuum. If you give people access to prosperity, they have greater social stability. If you have greater social stability, you have greater political stability. If you have greater political stability, it's the bedrock upon which our collective security is built. And if you interrupt that continuum with protectionism, isolationism, and nationalism, do not be surprised if the consequence is greater political radicalization or greater mass migration. In a world where we're more interconnected and interdependent than ever before, if we take bad decisions in one part of the world, don't expect them not to be replicated or have an effect in another part of the world. We cannot any longer believe that we can take decisions in the powerful nations of the world and have no cause to answer if things go wrong somewhere else. We will have to learn the reality of globalization is that we have to have common solutions to common problems. Turning your back on others is not a sustainable way forward. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur Fox. Je conclue cette deuxième ronde de questions en me tournant vers uh, Monsieur Védrine. Uh, je vous ai interrompu tout à l'heure alors que vous alliez uh, évoquer des illusions dont se seraient bercés uh, certains acteurs, uh, notamment quant à l'évolution de la nature des relations internationales. Donc, euh, je, je vous laisse le, le soin de, de continuer sur ces illusions, mais peut-être avez-vous euh, deux ou trois commentaires par rapport à ce qu'on a déjà entendu. Oui, c'est toujours enrichissant d'entendre de, les autres dans ces tables rondes. Plusieurs petites remarques, mais vraiment rapides. D'abord, je pense que la menace numéro un, c'est la question écologique. C'est pire que tout ce dont on parle le compte à rebours écologique, et pas que sur le climat. Je ne développe pas. Je pense que c'est évident pour tout le monde. Euh, deuxièmement, euh, je conseille vraiment aux gens dans la salle de réétudier la guerre froide, la vraie guerre froide, celle qui s'est terminée par le triomphe de l'Occident, à partir de la réelle politique de l'Occident, et pas par la croisade, par la réelle politique menée par euh, sept ou huit présidents américains excellents. Alors, comme on a oublié que les gens mélangent tout, que si on croit que c'est la même chose, je pense que c'est historiquement très, très utile. Et comment l'Occident, face à une menace, non pas simplement une guerre atroce comme l'Ukraine, mais une menace globale d'anéantissement, a réussi à garder son sang-froid, une intelligence stratégique incroyable, et a gagné à la fin, a gagné. C'est intéressant d'y repenser. Ensuite... Euh je pense que les Occidentaux vont se diviser maintenant sur la suite de la guerre en Ukraine. Alors, l'unité était maintenue, en partie recréée par Poutine, en quelque sorte. Mais je pense qu'aux États-Unis, entre les Américains, les Européens, certains Européens, il y aura toujours le soutien à l'Ukraine pour que Poutine ne puisse pas gagner. Mais sur la suite et les conclusions possibles, vous verrez apparaître des divisions. Je ne le souhaite pas. Mais c'est important que les Occidentaux en parlent entre eux, que certains éditorialistes américains de très haut niveau commencent à dire, à réfléchir à la suite. Ensuite, mondialisation. De même que les Occidentaux n'ont plus le monopole de la puissance, mais qu'ils restent très puissants. On n'aura pas la même mondialisation que les 30 dernières années. C'est fini, ça. L'américano-globalisation financiarisée, dérégulée, qui avait conduit à la crise de 2008, elle est derrière nous. En revanche, je pense que la mondialisation va continuer, mais fragmentée, plus ou moins. Ça dépend jusqu'où. Et là, évidemment, si elle est trop fragmentée, on perd des bénéfices de la mondialisation. Ça reste jouable, mais ça, ça dépend essentiellement de la suite du bras de fer entre la Chine et les États-Unis. Dernière remarque. 
dans la phase actuelle, quand Poutine a attaqué, ce qui est évidemment incontestable, il s'est trouvé une quarantaine de pays aux Nations Unies, représentant 60% de l'humanité, pour ne pas choisir les pays qui n'ont pas voté ou qui ont voté et qui n'ont pas condamné la Russie. Tout le monde sait qu'ils ne sont pas pour la Russie, ils ne sont pas pour la guerre, ils ne sont pas pour Poutine. Mais c'est des pays qui ne veulent pas se retrouver dans le camp occidental, compte tenu du passé. Et quand on regarde la, ce que disent les dirigeants russes et leurs conseillers ou les Chinois, ils pensent que l'Occident est sur le déclin pour des tas de raisons historiques. L'Occident est trop vieux, les gens ne travaillent plus assez, euh, l'Occident est rongé par les minorités qui empêchent les majorités de gouverner en réalité. Donc la démocratie est très affaiblie. L'affrontement islam-islamisme qui est présent dans tous les pays musulmans au monde s'est également développé en Europe. C'est un élément qui rend la, disons, les choix politiques de plus en plus compliqués, etc. etc. Donc je ne parle, je parle pas de votre point de vue, je parle du point de vue russe. Du point de vue russe, ce sont des éléments qui conduisent à un accident affaibli, qu'on peut attaquer. Et là, il ne faudrait pas que les pays du Sud, les, non les nouveaux non-alignés, le nouveau Sud, le Global South, il ne faudrait pas qu'ils fassent la même erreur que Poutine. Parce que Poutine s'est trompé sur l'Ukraine, il s'est trompé sur son armée, encore plus, bien sûr, et il s'est trompé sur l'Occident. Donc je pense que les... Moi, je comprends très bien, vu ma culture et mon expérience à moi, je comprends très bien que les pays de ce qu'on appelait autrefois le non-aligné ne veulent pas être dans un camp. Ça ne me choque pas. Mais il ne faut pas qu'ils se gourrent sur les, les forces et les faiblesses des uns et des autres, y compris pour défendre leurs intérêts vitaux euh, dans le long terme, 10 ans, 20 ans, 30 ans. Aujourd'hui, la capacité d'invention sur le plan technologique, les capacités d'avenir, c'est dans les pays démocratiques, en fait. Là où il y a un État-providence qui coûte trop cher, bien sûr, mais enfin, là où il y a un État-providence, c'est un mélange d'organisation sociale et de liberté. Même la Chine, avec sa puissance géante, elle n'arrive pas à égaler les États-Unis sur le plan des tout derniers développements de l'informatique ou de l'électronique ou des semi-conducteurs. Donc je pense que les... Encore une fois, je ne suis pas choqué en tant qu'ancien ministre que les pays de ce qu'on appelait le Sud gèrent leurs intérêts. C'est normal. On ne reviendra jamais aux trois siècles d'avant. Mais il faut qu'ils le fassent de façon très maligne. Très maligne, très... avec une claire conscience de leurs propres intérêts. Et là, Poutine ne gagnera pas. En plus, je suis contre le fait d'aller à la guerre avec la Russie, bien sûr. Mais il ne gagnera pas. Et d'une façon ou d'une autre, il n'y aura pas une solution. Il n'y a pas de solution dans l'affaire de l'Ukraine, mais il peut y avoir ils ont un enlisement, euh, un enlisement du conflit. Donc il faudrait que l'ensemble des autres pays d'Afrique, du monde arabe, de l'Asie, etc., intègrent ça et réinventent les, les conditions de la coopération nouvelle avec l'Occident. Quant aux Occidentaux, je termine de ce mot, dont j'ai dit tout à l'heure qu'ils ils étaient obligés d'adapter complètement leur vision, euh, euh, disons, nombriliste et arrogante et tout ce qu'on veut, je veux dire par là qu'ils devront réinventer la coexistence pacifique. Même après Poutine, même après la guerre, pas demain, mais après-demain, il y aura toujours une Russie. Et en Russie, il n'y aura jamais des sociodémocrates scandinaves. Donc à un moment ou à un autre, l'Occident, peut-être en rage, hein, devra réimaginer comment on fait pour être à côté. Même chose avec la Russie, avec pardon, la Chine, etc. Donc c'est pour ça que je parlais de guerre froide tout à l'heure. On aurait intérêt à comprendre comment, à prise de la crise de Cuba, on a failli s'anéantir pour de vrai, on a inventé la coexistence pacifique. C'est le contraire de l'idée de croisade. C'est le contraire de l'idée que nos valeurs sont automatiquement les valeurs du monde entier. Donc l'Occident ne renoncera jamais à ces valeurs, mais il sera obligé de prendre en compte les valeurs des autres. C'est très compliqué pour l'Occident. Mais c'est très compliqué pour le Nouveau Sud aussi. Merci, M. Vébrine. Je crois que, professeur Allen Bogen, vous aviez peut-être euh, l'envie euh, d'intervenir avant que je n'ouvre euh, la parole à, à, à l'assistance. I mean, one of my biggest concerns about these domestic elections in November is precisely uh, what the foreign minister is talking about, because you know, whether the United States likes it or not, and I am a globalist and an internationalist, we're not going to be 
let loose. And so even if we don't want to be involved, we'll be called in. I'm reminded of the Cold War where, where we wanted to react, we were told to stand back, and when we stood back, we were told, why aren't you reacting? So um, anyway, uh, you know, these issues of water and ecology and food and so on, for me, are the antecedent conditions for a lot of these wars not taking place. But that doesn't tell you, change the fact that uh, Putin is a narcissist and a pretty dangerous man, and we need to get rid of him. Merci. Uh, alors, en tant qu'universitaire, observateur passionné de la scène internationale, autant vous dire que j'ai été très gâté. C'est presque les fêtes avant l'heure. Uh, et j'aurais des tonnes de questions à poser, et j'aimerais beaucoup garder, évidemment, les, les panélistes pour moi. Mais... On m'a bien précisé qu'il fallait que je vous laisse euh, la parole et je vois déjà des mains euh, levées. Donc, je vais vous inviter et je crois qu'il y a des personnes dans l'assistance qui vont pouvoir vous euh, amener euh, des micros donc à euh, vous manifester, à vous présenter brièvement et euh, à poser euh, vos questions de la façon la plus euh, brève et synthétique possible. Alors, je ne sais pas qui j'ai vu en premier, mais je crois que j'ai vu en premier monsieur euh, au premier rang. Donc, euh, allez-y. Si on peut amener un micro, s'il vous plaît, euh, au tout premier rang, s'il vous plaît. Euh, Manifestez-vous, si vous, pour quand, voilà. Non. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Hassan Saoud, de, de l'Institut royal des études stratégiques. Euh, J'ai deux petites questions. Une pour Monsieur le Ministre Vidril concernant euh, cette organisation euh, de la coopération de Shanghai avec sa dernière réunion euh, de, 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 où la Turquie, État otanien, euh, était présent. Pensez-vous que ça pourrait être un, un noyau de ce syndrome d'une nouvelle guerre froide Et est-elle d'abord viable Est-ce que cette, cette organisation, compte tenu des conflits internes, est-elle viable pour l'OTAN, évidemment, que je pose la question de la Turquie, État otanien très important, mais qui, est, qui joue l'électron libre. Comment vous l'expliquez Merci. Vous voulez peut-être répondre d'emblée aux questions, euh, Monsieur Vedrain ou Monsieur Colomina, comme, comme vous voulez. Allez, Monsieur Colomina, euh, allez-y. Euh, merci. C'est toujours une, une, une question que je reçois beaucoup, une question qui n'est qui est pas facile. Mais euh, la Turquie, c'est pour nous un, un, un allié essentiel du point de vue de sécurité. Euh, et, et, et enfin, c'est une équation qui, qui, est, qui est plutôt simple. Et, et c'est l'équation qu'il faut répondre. On veut la, Tur la Turquie avec nous comme un acteur essentiel de sécurité même s'ils ont des, des priorités nationales qui, quelquefois, peuvent nous éloigner un peu euh, des, une compréhension de la réalité qui est un peu différente, ou on les veut dehors à cause de ça La réponse est simple, à mon avis, on les veut dedans. <coughs> NATO is an organization that is absolutely respectful with foreign policy choices of our own allies. And in that sense, we only have to uh, respect uh, our allies' positions. I cannot firmly take a position on that. I can just say that uh, Turkey is a very relevant partner in terms of security and defense. It uh, provides a lot for Euro Atlantic uh, stability. And of course, we maintain very deep and thorough conversations uh, with Turkey on many aspects. I am the special representative of NATO for the Caucasus and Central Asia, you can imagine that in that capacity, I have to talk a lot with the Turks, who are a, a very fundamental actor in, in those two regions. But as I said, we respect very much their foreign policy choices, as long as they sustain the principles and the values that uh, bound us together. And we believe the Turks are a fundamental ally, and uh, in that sense, We should respect those uh, choices. Thank you. Monsieur Vedrin. En ce qui me concerne, je considère que l'organisation de Shanghai n'est pas une vraie alliance. Il n'y a pas l'équivalent du traité de 49 
qui a créé l'Alliance Atlantique. Et bon, il y a plusieurs pays là-dedans qui n'ont pas du tout envie d'être dominés par la Chine, en fait. Donc oui, c'est une alliance de circonstances pour faire des communiqués sur le monde post-occidental. Mais je crois que il est évident que le, la part de l'Occident dans le monde se relativise. C'est une disance statistique, ça. Mais je ne crois pas que ça puisse aller très loin. Quant à la guerre froide, il y a déjà une guerre froide, précisément pas chaude. En Ukraine, c'est une guerre chaude. Il y a déjà une guerre froide sur la technologie entre la Chine et les États-Unis. Donc le jeu est beaucoup plus confus et beaucoup plus ouvert que l'on croit. Merci. Je vais prendre une deuxième question. Euh, monsieur au milieu, euh, allez-y. Thank you very much. My name is Anton Giulio Calenda from uh, Italy, Limes Geopolitical uh, Magazine. I would like to make a question to Mr. Ellen Bogan. Uh, Mr. Ellen Bogan, do you think that uh, Kenan containment resulted in a failure? Uh, do you think that the United States, uh, back in the years, uh, should have uh, liquidated the uh, Soviet Union like they did with Japan? Thank you very much. Well, I do think we should liquidate their leader. Um, as far as that goes, yes, I, I just turned to uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary and said that one of the big fights that Wesley Clark had with Bill Clinton uh, was that he said back then we should go for Sarimfrapol and, and for uh, Sevastopol and for Kaliningrad. So, um, yes, I think we should have done more at that time. And I think, in fact, a country like the Soviet Union is too big and Russia is too big to be able to manage itself, except with a kind of a dictatorship, that then it would be better to be a benevolent dictator and not somebody like Mr. Putin. Merci. Oh, oui. Is this being published somewhere? Or is this for you? Because you're making a video. Okay, that's fine. Don't destroy my career, thank you. Je vais prendre une troisième question. Allez-y, monsieur. Um, hello, I'm Hussein, students from uh, the University of Luxembourg. I, wanna, uh, I remarked first that there is only the representative of the West world. There is the absence of any Chinese or Russian, so we can hear different opinions and we can better reach, um, as Mr. Lombogan said, um, Morocco is the land of talks and resolving problems. Uh, but I want to address Mr. Elon Bogan, the NATO representative, and as well, uh, former Secretary of State of the United Kingdom. Do you think we need um, to reform the United Nations? Uh, many um, other officials or former officials have said this, whether in office or after they left office, we have to change or we have to make reforms in order to make stability. And do you think India and Japan or Brazil have to enjoy as well um, NATO, uh, not NATO, the Security Council, number one? And number two, do you think as well, if we were able to make the elected members of the um, Security Council can have as well, can have as well veto. So we cannot always uh, keep veto for permanent members, but probably for um, elected members can help as well for uh, making the world more stable sometimes. Uh, because, uh, in my opinion, yeah, because keeping the veto for permanent members makes the permanent members um, um, make uh, or exploit their opportunities, be selfish, not seeking for world peace. Merci. I'll just start it. Yes, I think Brazil, Japan, Germany, that the Security Council should be reformed. But on the UN, this is one area where John Bolton agree 100%. I think it's useless. There, that's my answer. And so I'll never have a career at the UN. But as far as the theoretical question of the Security Council, yes, the Security Council is old, marauded, and represents the times of 1945. It should be redone. How one does it, I don't know. Don't ask me that question. I don't have a good solution. Um, I, I take a different, a different stance. Uh, I've been uh, many years of my career involved uh, with UN matters, and, uh, and your question is actually going to the heart of many of the conversations that are taking place since 15 years ago at the UN. 
my own country was part of one of the biggest initiatives, United for Consensus, Spain, my own country as Spain. Um, so we've, we've been looking into that. I think, and as I started, that the UN has fulfilled a, a very important role. And with its, its weaknesses, that there are weaknesses, I think it's provided a, a level of stability um, and security which was quite decent for many decades. Apart from being the global organization that there is and, and, and the forum for uh, consultations. But there is a need to go for a reform, but it's very difficult. Um, is, um, if you put it very simply, is that if you ask kings to just um, forget about their privileges and uh, share those privileges with other people. It's very difficult. And the Security Council is at the heart of that conversation. How do you actually ask the five permanent members to have less power in order for others to have more power? But I, I do believe that there is a reform to be made, but I'm not the only one that believes that. And, uh, and it's part, as I said, of the hard work of many diplomats in the last uh, probably two decades. Merci. Uh, Peut-être M. Vébrin et M. Fox pour... Uh... I think it's a, it's a fabulous question because it's at the heart of all the global institutions today. All the institutions that we have, uh, from the UN to its uh, subsidiaries, UNCTAD and others, uh, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, a whole range of those institutions were designed for the world that existed in the second half of the 20th century. They were not institutions designed for where we are today, and they have failed to evolve in the changes that the world has seen. And it, it's a tremendous, it, I think we can all agree that we have to have evolution in those institutions. The question is how? Uh, and very often the, the, the difficulty lies in the institutions themselves. So um, the one that I perhaps know best, the World Trade Organization, has decided that what was in its original uh, rules, which was about consensus, that that consensus should be interpreted as, as unanimity. And when, if, if consensus meant unanimity, we wouldn't have two different words for them. Um, but if you choose to, uh, to define consensus as being unanimity, you can never change because it only takes one voice against change to stop change for everyone. And, and therein lies the difficulty, as, as your question implied. Uh, how, how do you make these changes? The, the, the Security Council, incidentally, is not the GDP Council. Uh, you're not there because you've got a big GDP. It's because you've got a big role in, in security. So uh, very, very difficult uh, decisions. And I think that if I were to press, put my finger on one thing without uh, really in any way demeaning any of my colleagues, I think there is a global leadership vacuum that needs to be filled. Where are the great figures with the vision to be able to take others with them and set out a different pathway? And just to pick up something on something that Michu Vedrine said, that the West would have to come to terms with very different views of others. That doesn't mean that we ever, and he didn't imply this incidentally, but it doesn't mean we ever have to agree with them because I believe that democracy is better than totalitarianism. I, better, I think a rule of law is better than arbitrary justice. I think human rights is better than oppression of gender or anything else. And I think that the values that we have are not just different, they're better. And we should not be afraid to say that they're better because that is the bedrock of a better world. En ce qui me concerne, je rappellerai que les deux seuls membres permanents qui sont depuis plus de 20 ans favorables à l'élargissement du Conseil, c'est la Grande-Bretagne et la France. Le, Conseil de, le, le, le statut des Nations Unies a été créé par les vainqueurs, c'est-à-dire les États-Unis, à la conférence de San Francisco. Il faut l'unanimité des membres permanents pour changer. Et depuis qu'on en parle, la Chine pour ne prendre que cet exemple, est absolument opposé à l'entrée du Japon et de l'Inde. Les pays africains n'ont jamais été capables de se mettre d'accord sur quels seraient leurs représentants, même s'il est tournant. Les pays arabes en tant que tels ont quasiment toujours été oubliés, oubliés dans les plans. Les pays latino-américains ont toujours été incapables de se mettre d'accord sur le pays qui les représenterait. Mais il répond que la question ne s'est même pas posée, parce que les trois principaux, les plus lourds, dans les membres permanents du Conseil de sécurité, c'est-à-dire les États-Unis, 
l'URSS la est devenue la Russie et la Chine, sont contre. Donc c'est une discussion qui ne peut conduire nulle part, sauf une nouvelle guerre mondiale avec des vainqueurs différents. Merci. Si on mesure la pertinence d'une question à la volonté de panél des panélistes de tous y répondre, je pense que vous avez marqué pas mal de points. Euh, je me tourne vers monsieur ici pour euh, une autre question. Allez-y. Merci, monsieur le Président. Je m'appelle Dr. Abdelhafid Walalo, vice-président de l'Institut marocain des relations internationales. C'est un think tank indépendant au Maroc. Monsieur Vidrine, un grand ami du Maroc, qui connaît très bien le Maroc, une question à vous, monsieur Vidrine. Comment vous expliquez l'abstention de plusieurs pays africains, arabes, à l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies sur la question de la condamnation de la Russie, sachant très bien que le Maroc n'a pas participé au vote alors qu'il a de bonnes relations avec les États-Unis dans le cadre d'un partenariat stratégique que les États-Unis ont reconnu la marocanité du Sahara, mais le, le Maroc a de bonnes relations aussi avec l'Inde, avec la Chine, avec Moscou, avec tout le monde, étant donné que c'est un pays ouvert. C'est un pays souverain aussi et qui accepte mal le sang euh, qu'on lui dicte d'en haut ou de l'Occident. Une petite question à M. Marc des États-Unis. Euh, vous êtes un fidèle de Médès, on se connaît. Euh, comment euh, vous dites que la Chine est une grande menace pour les peuples alors que la Chine, c'est le premier investisseur en Afrique que grâce à, au partenariat entre le Maroc et la Chine, que nous avons eu les vaccins, les premiers vaccins Sinopharm, par des millions de, de doses, et que actuellement il y a un grand projet, pas loin de Casablanca, pour la production des vaccins pour le Maroc et l'Afrique, en partenariat toujours avec la Chine populaire, sous la conduite de Sa Majesté Mohamed VI. Comment vous expliquez ça, le, M. Marc Une toute, toute dernière question à M. Abdallah. Et je vous félicite, vous avez parlé en arabe, je vais aussi vous poser la question en arabe. Kaifa tu kayimoun al alakat bay bayinal l'ulet moutahid al amirikia ou al saoudia bada ziarat bayden lil mantaka ou ma ya esbab hada tawatur bayin al saoudia ou bayden ma ya ta'alak bi hukouk al insan kama yukal fi Washington ou la kin ou naka tahadi taki ou intaj taka. Wakararat COP plus. Merci. Merci. Alors, je vais demander à, à nos trois panélistes qui ont été directement interpellés de, de répondre très brièvement, parce qu'on commence à me faire des signes sur euh, le temps euh, qui arrive à, à son terme pour euh, ce panel. Donc, monsieur Védrine, pour commencer, Alice. Mmh, cher monsieur, j'ai déjà répondu tout à l'heure. Je pense que dans les, la quarantaine de pays qui n'ont pas voulu condamner l'agression russe, qui est pourtant une évidence. Il y a la Chine, alors bon, là, ça se passe de commentaires. Et après, il y a des pays dont certains dépendent de la Russie, en vrai, pour des raisons militaires, pour des raisons économiques. Il y a quelques pays d'Afrique très faibles qui comptent sur Wagner pour rester au pouvoir. Bon, à mon avis, c'est un marché de dupes, mais enfin, c'est leur problème. Et il y a plein de pays qui ne sont pas pas pour la guerre et qui n'aiment pas forcément Poutine, mais qui ne veulent pas se retrouver dans le camp occidental, compte tenu des, de l'histoire du passé. Alors là aussi, c'est peut-être... On peut comprendre politiquement, surtout dans les pays où l'opinion, l'émotion compte beaucoup, et c'est un peu un calcul à courte vue. Donc ces pays qui pourraient distinguer le, le maintien de relations utiles de leur point de vue avec la Russie, puis d'autre part la, la condamnation de la guerre, mais enfin c'est leur problème. Je n'ai pas donné des leçons. En tout cas, j'avais déjà répondu en quelque sorte. Professeur Ellen Bogan. Um, well, when I've been here before, I, we recognize each other. I've actually been a great supporter of the king, but on this particular issue, I'm not. China does not come into North Africa, nor does it come into Morocco or any of the places it goes into to be magnanimous. It goes in to take control. It mostly does not hire local workers. It brings in its own Chinese prison workers, and whatever it does to the local workers is about the same. And so if you want a, an economy that pays you $1 a month, then continue to rely on China. Otherwise, get rid of them. And the fact is, whatever you say about the United States, and trust me, I know we can be very stupid, um, 
mostly USers do things because they want to believe in it. They don't go in with this kind of idea, let's just be surreptitious rats that take things over. We do sometimes, but that isn't the principal way USers of all colors look at the planet. China is not doing it to make you better. And the vaccine issue they're doing to have an excuse and an alibi so they can keep you by the you know what's. Thank you. Dr. Abdullah, the last word. What was the other question? Uh, no, it's a comment maybe for a discussion oh, after the panel if you want to. But I will give the last word to Dr. Abdullah because we are already past. طبعا نحن نأمل من الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية دعم دول الخليج العربي خاصة في التصدي لهجمات الحوثيين على المملكة العربية السعودية وعلى أيضا دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة وأيضا حبيت أني أعلق أن في نقطة مهمة وذكرتها أيضا في حديثي ألا وهو السعي للعمل المشترك الإقليمي السعي للعمل المشترك الإقليمي وتبين ذلك لنا جليا خاصة في فترة تحدي جائحة كورونا العمل ما بين الدول لمواجهة هذا التحدي وأيضا الاكتفاء الغذائي بحيث أنه يعطينا القدرة على الاكتفاء نفسنا وأيضا العمل بنفسنا وأيضا مواجهة كافة التحديات على الأصعدة كافة بأنفسنا وشكرا Merci, Dr. Abdullah. Malheureusement, le, le temps imparti à cette session a échoué. Je suis désolé, euh, on me met la pression pour que je mette inter... Vous pourrez interpeller peut-être après euh, nos conférenciers. Euh, mon nom est Julien Toureil. Ça a été un honneur et un plaisir d'animer cette discussion, même si sous la chaleur des projecteurs, il fait bien plus chaud que ce à quoi je suis habitué à Montréal. Je vous invite à vous joindre à moi pour remercier nos distingués panélistes chaleureusement et interpeller-les après pour leur poser vos questions. Merci à vous.